Hello everyone and welcome to the Forestry Adaptation Community of Practice webinar today. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Annette Morand and I am the facilitator of the online adaptation communities of practice. And those are run by us here at OPR, which is the Ontario Centre for Climate Impacts and Adaptation Resources and we're located at Laurentian University in Sudbury, Ontario. So the way the webinar will run is as follows. So after this short introduction, we'll have the main presentation, which will go for about 35 or 40 minutes. And then at the end of the webinar, we'll have some time left over for any questions that you might have in the center. So if you have any questions during the webinar, we just ask that you please wait until the end. And before we get going, I just have a few housekeeping items to go over. Um, so first, for those of you who dialed into the conference call line, um, your lines have been automatically muted. Uh, the reason for this is just to avoid any audio distractions or feedback during the webinar. So to ask a question during the Q&A, all you're going to have to do is hit star six and that will unmute your line. Um, but please do keep your line muted during the presentation. Also, you'll notice that there's a chat box on the left-hand side of your screen. So you can use this chat box to field any questions that you might have for the presenter. Um, as well, if you have any technical difficulties during the webinar, you can also use this area to type your message or you can click on my name and send me a private message and I can try to help you as best as I can. I also want to mention that we are recording the webinar today and I'll be sending out a copy of the recording to everyone who has pre-registered with me and we'll also be posting it to the Community of Practice website. And finally, I know we have some people on the line today who may not be familiar with what the Forestry Adaptation Community of Practice or the FA COP is. So I wanted to quickly mention that it's an interactive online community and it's dedicated to those who are working in forestry or who are simply interested in forestry and climate change in Canada. So it includes features such as online resource libraries, news articles, discussion forums, upcoming climate change events, and much more. Um, and so it's free to join. Um, if there's anybody on the line today who's interested in learning more about the FACOP, you can click on the link in the chat box there for more information and to register. So with that being said, we're very excited to have Roger on the line with us today to talk about climate-related impacts to high latitude and elevation forests. And just so you know a little bit more about your presenter, um, Roger graduated from the Forestry Technology Program at the Northern Alberta Institute of Technology in 1991. So after a short stint with the Alberta Forest Service, he began his career with the Canadian Forest Service as a forest insect and species survey ranger. So when that program was ending in 97, Roger transitioned to his position of forest health supervisor. So one of Roger's primary roles is to advise and share forest health monitoring expertise with regional jurisdictions. And two of his ongoing projects have been to provide assistance and training to the Government of Northwest Territories Forest Health Monitoring Program and coordinate forest health monitoring activities with the Northern and Rocky Mountain National Parks. So on behalf of everyone joining us, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to you, Roger, uh, for taking the time to present this webinar for us today. It's very much appreciated. Um, so without further ado, I will now hand things over to you. Uh, thanks very much, Annette. Um, yeah, so basically the following presentation is, is more or less the same presentation I uh, gave at the National Pest Forum in Ottawa uh, just this last November. And it's not so much about uh, climate-related research, but more about what issues uh, or changes we see uh, currently happening in these, uh, these high latitude and elevation forests. Um, I'm going to be going through a lot of pictures today. Uh, it's very much a show and tell. Uh, so I'll try and stay uh, on, on time and on topic. I'd also like to take uh, uh, an opportunity right up front um, to mention that none of this, uh, none of these work would be possible without the strong collaboration and support of Parks Canada and the uh, government of the Northwest Territory. So um, basically, there's uh, two forest health monitoring programs that are involved with out of our region. The first uh, is with the uh, government of Northwest Territory, uh, a collaborative, collaborative agreement, um, basically to provide ongoing training advice uh, in their forest health and mountain pine beetle program. Um, that's how it started off. It's more, it's more turned into a collaboration, basically due to the issues that we see occurring over, uh, especially over the last decade, uh, locally here at, at uh, Northern uh, CFS, we feel uh, it's important that we we uh, stay on top of these issues and, and contribute and assist as much as possible. Um, 
So looking at the map, the area in light red within the Northwest Territory, uh, this is the general survey area covered uh, under that program. The second uh, program is uh, the Canadian Forest Service Parks Canada Forest Health Memo of Understanding. Uh, this is a long ongoing uh, uh, program to provide detection and monitoring uh, expertise to uh, Parks Canada and their federal land. Um, this, this responsibility, it's been shared over the last uh, couple decades uh, between the Pacific Forestry Centre and Northern Forestry Centre. Uh, and we recently uh, resumed responsibility for the, national, uh, the Rocky National Parks in 2013. The Northern National Parks I've been doing uh, since the beginning, uh, since the early 90s. So um, basically on the map you see the uh, MOU currently covers the parks that are uh, labeled in red. And these parks make up a, a substantial portion of the forested uh, national parks within the boreal forest. Uh, important to point out here quickly that uh, Tulani is part of the, uh, the MOU, uh, but however, due to logistics and, and, and budgetary constraints, they have not been uh, looked at since, I believe, since about 2008 uh, from the Pacific Forestry Center. So we're, we hope to change that in the near future. The third project uh, basically is uh, uh, an emerging project. It's, it's building upon the, the first two. Uh, and the goal is to increase monitoring research in these, uh, these two areas uh, and basically get some science behind the observations that we're seeing um, and, and really to, to uh, start uh, looking at assessing forest vulnerability and developing adaptation strategy, strategies uh, uh, along with these uh, jurisdictions. Uh, the main program lead for the uh, Healthia project is Jason Edwards out of the Northern Forester Center. And the group is comprised of many CFS researchers uh, here locally, uh, climate, landscape, fire, and insect and disease uh, disciplines. So basically, what's the problem? Well, I mean, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here, but uh, there's a general warming trend uh, occurring across uh, Western Canada. Warming is highest in, in Western Canada, uh, sorry, occurring across Canada. The warming is, is highest in Western Canada, and this is especially true uh, in the Northwest. This uh, scary orange Environment Canada map here, it depicts the warming trend basically from 1948 to 2012. Uh, I don't believe it's been updated yet over the last few years, but definitely nothing's changed uh, since that time. So uh, because of this warming trend, what we're seeing is increased observations in climate-related damage and mortality appearing. Uh, we, we see uh, pest dynamics changing. We see pest ranges uh, uh, changing. We see new observations occurring. And we see, a, uh, we see secondary pest complexes playing a, a more significant role in forest uh, health impact. Um, some good examples of, of Test uh, activity under this warming trend would, of course, be the, the expansion of mountain pine beetle over the last couple decades, uh, its unprecedented northern and eastern expansion, as well as the current Jasper National Park expansion, uh, which uh, did a resurgence here in 2013. Uh, other climate related examples, of course, would be uh, Aspen Parkland, uh, drought issues, and uh, I mean, you could even look at uh, uh, the, the current spruce beetle uh, outbreak uh, going on in, in uh, BC interior right now. Uh, a couple other maps, or sorry, a couple of the graph sites are on here just to illustrate uh, the warming trend. Uh, Fort Smith summertime temperatures uh, showing a different, a definite uh, upswing. Um, this is no different in any other uh, northern community uh, uh, graph. Um, Particular, I want you to keep in mind the 1970 range. You'll see uh, that's when things really start to warm up, and we'll we'll talk about that uh, later on in some other graphs. Um, the climate moisture index uh, graph from Jasper, I'll talk more about later, but just definitely showing a, a significant uh, uh, warming trend, and things are getting much drier down in that area. And again, 1970 seems to be 
the, the uh, tipping point where things really start to warm up. So um, getting on to the observations, we're going to start in the north and uh, work our way south. But starting in the north here, we're looking uh, at the Norm Wells Toledo area. There, there has, appears to be some large areas of primarily black spruce forest uh, declining in these areas, uh, specifically along the Mackenzie River Valley in the flat. Um, this was actually first brought to my attention by um, uh, a longtime resident and uh, government of Northwest Territories resource officer out of Norman Wells. Uh, he, he noticed some, uh, uh, the forests just weren't looking as healthy as they used to, and he noticed uh, uh, a lot of the uh, stressed looking foliage discoloration, that kind of thing, uh, invited me to come and take a look while we were doing surveys that year. Uh, I did get on the ground. I did. Uh, I did uh, do some sampling and, and looking at the soil and foliage, and I took some dip. Uh, nothing out of the ordinary in the uh, foliage or soil, except uh, high water table was, was uh, very obvious in many of the uh, sites I looked at, uh, some standing water in some locations. Um, so although, although this change uh, in this area it was quite noticeable, uh, it, it's also fair to mention that these are pretty pretty harsh environments uh, still up there. Uh, so much of the foliage clumping and branch breakage, it, it can be normal in a lot of these stands because you get a lot of winter or spring uh, freeze thaw type events, snow and ice build up, that kind of thing, and it affects the trees. However, the general, the general change and overall stress and decline in these areas is, is quite apparent uh, over the last uh, couple of decades, especially since I've been up there. And uh, I mean, these are just not typically healthy black spruce stands. So. And just for information's sake, uh, the two tree, the, the two uh, pictures on the bottom, uh, the areas in the areas that I sampled, basically, uh, DBH has ranged from roughly five to eleven centimeters, and the ages of the trees were roughly 100 to uh, 210 uh, years old. So. Another area, looking further, a little further south, but stay, uh, staying with the, uh, the northern end here, um, we see a lot of aspen decline uh, occurring, a lot of aspen mortality. Uh, these are, these, in most of these areas, um, high water tables appear to be the primary factor, although we're also seeing a general decline symptoms uh, similar to what we see uh, observed in the, in the uh, southern prairie, prairie areas. Aspen Parkland. Uh, these two pictures, the one labeled Drunken Forest and the other one on the top on the left, um, what we suspect occurring in these areas, of course, high water table, uh, the roots are drowning and they die due to a lack of oxygen. They can no longer per hold purchase in the soil and they end up toppling over in this direction. And it's also possible in some of these areas, uh, there's a permafrost freeze thaw, thaw event events are occurring and uh, playing, are playing a role, if not uh, helping to increase the high water table. Uh, the other picture here, we also see uh, an edge effect where water, the water table is, is uh, rising in these naturally low areas, these bogs or swamps, and um, it's encroaching onto the higher ground where aspen or mixed with forests are drowning out. Um, taking a look on the map, so you get this edge effect of mortality in the area. Uh, so looking on this uh, tiny little map, which is probably hard to make out, I have some arrows up at the top, and that's just depicting that uh, basically uh, as far as the range of Aspen goes, uh, this, we're seeing uh, these kind of uh, issues occurring. And the further north you go, the, the uh, continuous large stands of Aspen that we see in the south around Fort Liard, Fort Simpson area, uh, checkpoint area, these uh, fade more into Aspen Islands or strips of islands or uh, that, that are on uh, the flat up in the, uh, the far north or on hillsides. Uh, and fair to mention that uh, the, the, the areas in the flats aren't doing well, but the areas on hillsides are doing a little bit better. So looking on the map again, you'll see a little area here by yeah, by uh, Fort Providence area here. We're going to look at that next. So 
basically what we're seeing in this area is a very large scale flooding event. It's occurring roughly 10 kilometers north of Fort Providence. The flooding mortality uh, is very spread out uh, and it's in a, a naturally low area that follows tributaries that spread up into higher ground. But uh, I estimate the bulk or epicenter of this area to be roughly 20 to 30,000 hectares and uh, the overall encompassing area affected to be much greater, probably around 100 to 150,000 hectares. Taking a little uh, closer look at it, um, this the area, the flooding area was found actually this last year uh, while conducting surveys. We don't normally, uh, the normal survey route doesn't go into this area, so it's been occurring for a number of years and has been uh, has been missed. Um, basically, taking a look at the the fire data, we see two large fires uh, that have occurred in the last 20 years in this area. And incidentally, I was uh, flying uh, the Forest Health Survey back in 1995 along the southern edge of that Horn Plateau mapping spruce budworm as it was burning. And I remember how, how large of a fire it was. That fire turned out to be about 1.1 million hectares. And there was a, even a more recent uh, fire uh, in 2014 uh, that was a, so the fire just northeast of Fort Providence. And that was 750,000 hectares. So also looking at the digital elevation model the data, uh, we can see that the excess water no longer being absorbed by these burnt forests uh, follows the drainage patterns and basically accumulates in this naturally low area uh, in, in here. So we have water draining off the, the plateau, accumulating and coming down in here as well from the 2014 fire, we see that it could be coming down into this area. So it's accumulating here before it drains out into the Mackenzie River. Um, so the other thing I wanted to point out in this area is um, some slumping events that are occurring along the Horn Plateau because of the instability of the soil. And now, uh, basically, just to, for interest, interest sake, you can actually see these large-scale uh, slumping events and large uh, mortality, flooding mortality can be seen on Google Earth imagery if, uh, if you're interested later. So again, quickly just looking at what we're seeing on the ground in these flooding areas, obviously saturated soils and uh, standing water in some locations. Moving on to the opposite end of the spectrum, we see moisture deficits uh, causing damage. So. Uh, multiple species, various areas throughout the territory, we see drought uh, damage occurring. Uh, two to point out specifically here are the mature, mature jack pine stands uh, in the bottom right. Uh, these are uh, suffering it's due to very, they're in very porous soils, very gravelly soils, and they can no longer hold the moisture under these drought conditions and, and are, are suffering as well. Uh, a lot of jack pine region uh, areas uh, are being affected uh, along that same uh, highway area near Buffalo River, as well as over by Campsell Bend, uh, up towards the Willow Lake uh, River area along, along the McKenzie River. Other symptoms we're seeing, um, again, slumping events just seem to be uh, more, uh, more prevalent uh, in the last couple of years, we're seeing them more and more. I show this one here because it was quite striking. It just, apparently it just occurred uh, last year because I don't remember it in 2015. Uh, it's a slumping event just outside of uh, Fort Simpson. And what's concerning about this particular slumping event is up in the north uh, communities, especially around the main communities, you, you get locals having a lot of uh, cabins, hunting cabins and, and uh, summertime cabins out. Uh, stretching out along the river systems uh, close to the community. Luckily, there was no cabin on this on this uh, stretch that uh, collapsed into the river, but uh, it does pose a concern if these slumping events are going to continue. Um, so uh, the other picture that's really interesting here, here is the one below, uh, underneath it is uh, repeated red belting occurring west of uh, Norman Wells. This is along the Mackenzie Mountain Range, uh, just on the edge of it. 
So what's interesting about this is that red belt, um, normally a red belting effect is a winter drying effect. It'll, it'll recover uh, in a year. Um, what's happening here is we're seeing some, and you can see it a little bit of in the picture, you see some grain in that mortality setting. So this is repeated red belting. It's, a, it's occurring year after year. The trees aren't getting a chance to recover. So you get a, a winter uh, warm winds occurring across uh, the edge of the, the range there and uh, drying out the trees in the wintertime. Um, the picture below it is also another interesting picture. This is uh, was provided by Wilfrid Laurier University. It's a, a uh, uh, they have an experimental farm basically 50 kilometers south of Port Simpson. This picture is a drunken, I call it the drunken black spruce because uh, it's very similar to what we see in uh, in the Aspen in, those, in these areas. Uh, this is being caused by uh, uh, freeze thawing of the permafrost event. And this is a relatively healthy uh, black spruce stem that's been affected. So it causes the instability of the soil, the shifting of the soil, and you get these trees falling over different directions. Picture beside it, uh, spruce bugworm mortality, which has been exacerbated by drought uh, conditions in the Wood Buffalo and Slave River areas. Uh, this has been occurring for a number of years, uh, in, the, in the last decade especially, and it seems to be getting worse. Um, and then just some other incidental things, uh, climate-related damage. We see snow load damage as well as uh, direct sun scalding on, on certain stuff in the territory. Wildfires. Okay, uh, we've seen some pretty large, uh, intense wildfires up in the territories uh, over the last few years. Um, you know, the, the suspicion and, and obvious uh, concern is drought may be increasing the frequency and severity. In 2014, in the Northwest Territories, 3.5 million hectares were burned, and this was the highest on record for, for area and severity burn uh, since, I believe, the, the mid-60s. Since they've been they've been mapping and recording uh, the fires, uh, so we have uh, a few researchers, fire researchers, up in the Wood Buffalo and, and in the Northwest Territories, looking at uh, uh, particularly looking at reburns. And reburns are where you have a fire one year, and then within a uh, certain amount of time, the fire will come back through and reburn that area. Uh, so they're looking at the um, consequences of that. Uh, basically, these two pictures are actually one-year reburn. They were burnt in 2014 in Wood Buffalo, and then reburned again in 2016. So, uh, substantial uh, trauma, basically, uh, uh, that uh, occurred in, in these uh, to these soils and to these these areas. So, what what preliminary research is showing is uh, these reburns tend to revegetate very slowly. Sometimes they they can revegetate into alternate forest type or even into non forest and and incidentally read an article yesterday from uh, California uh, researchers that uh, looked at drought fires in Ponderosa pine stand uh, that were not revegetating they were turning into grass basically uh, so the other concern is that these reburn intervals are going to uh, shorten under drought the obvious concern here is is uh, not just for uh, local communities. We've had some uh, pretty pretty disastrous consequences with fires in communities in the last few decades in the last decade. Um, but it's it's the economics of, of uh, sustainable forest management practices as well. So moving into pests, uh, pest changes, uh, pest increased pest activity. So when we look at the Historic and recent survey data uh, for uh, these two pests in particular, spruce budworm and forest and caterpillar, and we, we suspect a northward range expansion. Um, these pests, uh, for spruce, spruce budworm especially, uh, we've seen an uh, uh, outbreak in the Mackenzie Delta for the first time in 2015, first recorded time. So for the longest time, spruce budworm has made it up as far as about uh, Fort Good Hope. Up to uh, up until about 2001. After 2001, uh, we started noticing it uh, going further north. Um, that's not to say that spruce bloodworm hasn't been present at endemic or even light levels in the far north. I believe it has. Uh, it's just never been 
uh, it's never reached a noticeable outbreak uh, status uh, such that people would be aware of it and uh, and inform forest health folks that uh, there's an issue up there. There was some pheromone trapping uh, done and there was pheromone trap results uh, collected that had endemic counts up in those areas. So we know it's been up there, just never been really outbreaks before that we know of. Uh, so looking at forest and caterpillar, of course, forest recorded outbreak occurred in uh, Fort Liard area, came up through, through BC, and uh, conditions were right to make it past north of 60, and that was the first recorded outbreak in the territory. Again, uh, more recently in 2014, it expanded uh, north of high level coming out of Alberta, north of uh, in Wood Buffalo National Park into the territory and has spread even further than it did in uh, 95. Uh, again, a couple other pests to uh, make mention of. Uh, long ongoing outbreaks of aspen serpentine leaf miner and uh, willow blotch leaf miner. Uh, these two uh, pests are relatively secondary pests, but when you have severe outbreaks of aspen serpentine leaf miner, which have been going on up in the territories, especially for at least 20 years, uh, they are bound to have an impact on, on the, the health and uh, growth of our aspen trees up there. So these are, these are large outbreaks that actually are not just, uh, uh, not just within the Northwest Territories, they've been spread throughout Western Canada and up into Alaska, so very large outbreaks. Uh, Yukon didn't note any note any last year, so uh, that that's a good thing. But we have no idea how how long these are going to continue, and uh, um, they're continuing much longer than anyone has anticipated they would. So, uh, taking a closer look at the spruce budworm in the delta, I only want I only wanted to show this just because of some uh, when we were doing analysis on some ground sampling, we we found some interesting results in the forest. So um, basically, we conducted some tree core sampling in the delta last summer, uh, mainly to see if we could detect uh, spruce budworm signatures in the in the increment core data and determine when these these outbreaks uh, began. Uh, however, what was a really interesting story is the forest productivity we found uh, when we looked at the cores. Uh, the white spruce seemed to be definitely benefiting from the warming trend in the in the far north. If we look at the top graph here on the right, <coughs> it's the uh, uh, percent annual increment graph. Uh, for those that don't know, percent annual increment is basically a percent area of, uh, of an increment in relation to the basal area of the stem. So rather than just uh, measuring an increment width on a given radial axis of the disk uh, or the core, we, we um, that could be greatly affected by like uh, compression or tension in the, in this tree stem. So, uh, looking at percent annual increment is a better supposed to be a better unbiased measure of growth. Regardless, looking at the uh, looking at the graph and seeing uh, a definite increase in all four uh, sampling site locations, and again the 1970 range, uh, that's where we're starting to see this, this uh, tremendous. Uh, growth. When we looked at the mean annual temperature for the Inuvik area, uh, again, 1970, things start to really warm up. And what's very impressive is the warming trend since 1970 is basically a four degree increase. So that's four degrees, uh, you know, in basically 40, 45, 46 years, which is pretty substantial. What's interesting about this is that this, this positive growth trend is the exact opposite of what we are seeing at Southern Climate. So in Alberta and in, in Jasper, we did, did some work. It's, uh, we're showing declines in the south, in the far north, it's actually benefiting. So uh, getting back to secondary pests, uh, as I mentioned before, we're seeing a very a uh, large increase in secondary pest activity um, and new pests being found, but secondary pests, uh, they're, they're playing a very 
uh, normally play a very minor role when it comes to impact, uh, impact forest health. However, these drought-weakened trees in the north uh, are, are being impacted now to, to uh, a pretty good degree by various complexes of insects and disease that are just taking advantage of, of their weakened state. Um, it's not uncommon, as you see in the pictures here, to see three or four different agents affecting a single leaf on, uh, on Uh The picture on the far right is one I want to point out is, is of interest. These are drought-weakened jack pines being killed by a white-spotted sorghum beetle uh, over in the Fort Simpson checkpoint for Providence area as well. Um, roughly looking at 2,000 hectares plus uh, currently. Uh, what's interesting is the white-spotted sorghum beetle normally feeds on coniferous log deck or uh, fire-killed sand. Um, however, here we see it attacking live jack pine. Uh, now, what's, it's expected that these, these populations probably built up in some, some local uh, fires, fire-killed areas, like uh, they had a fire in Trout River uh, a few years ago. So it might be, it may build up in these, these fire-killed areas and expand into the weakened pine forests uh, uh, that are neighboring this area. Um, it's also being assisted, this, this white spotted sorry beetle is being assisted by other agents, including the logical pine beetle and uh, the pine engraver, so the hip, hips. So uh, moving on, more or less the same thing. A couple things I want to point out here. Uh, as far as diseases go, we had an uh, interesting occurrence in 2014, 2015. I started noticing a great deal in uh, Western gall rust uh, branch mortality occurring uh, in the uh, Fort Simpson checkpoint area. And uh, what is interesting about this is that these galls have been present on these trees. It's a very slow growing disease, so they've been present on these trees for uh, many number of years. However, uh, drought conditions come in and uh, weaken the trees sufficiently, and they just can't keep those branches alive and those, those branches die. And uh, we saw this occurring in 2014 to 2015. Uh, Another interesting one to point out is this new record of false hemlock looper was found in Fort Smith uh, 2013, I believe. And um, it was attacking spruce and pine, uh, causing some pretty severe defoliation uh, in the area. And this is a new record for its range. It's never been noted this far north. Uh, more recently, we have a northern 10 caterpillar outbreak, which is native uh, to the territories, but uh, uh, we don't see it often causing a substantial outbreak uh, damage. And we see this up by Yellowknife right now. And we have also noted it, noted it over by Norman Wells. Eastern large beetle as well, uh, native to the territories, but has, uh, has now, uh, you haven't really seen it cause much damage until, uh, until this last year. Uh, so moving to the south, we're gonna look at the Rocky Mountain National Parks. Um, I gotta speed it up here because I'm being slow, but, um, Basically, this is just a map showing survey areas that we cover in the uh, Rocky Park. Taking a look at the um, at one of the hotspots in the Rocky Mountain National Park, uh, this is Jasper National Park. Other hotspots, I would I would say within the Rocky Parks would be Waterton, uh, Kootenai Glacier, and Mount Revelstoke. And based on observation, uh, Banff and Yoho seem to be faring a little better than the other parks. Not to say that the other parks are in huge, dire trouble. They're not. It's just we see more observations in these parks than, than the others. In, uh, in 2014, we went into Jasper. We did some ground sampling, uh, basically to determine how the trees were faring under these, these severe drought conditions. The climate moisture index uh, graph, again, you see, uh, Again, uh, long-term uh, warming trend is continuing. Basically, in the last 10 years, we've seen severe drought since about, or since about 2003, uh, which is pretty substantial. 2014, of course, the hottest and driest on record since the 1940s. When we looked at the coring, uh, we cored various species. Uh, aspen growth decline uh, has been occurring since about 1970s, and spruce growth decline as well. Uh, 
has had some major collapses during during drought years. Um, so pretty su substantial uh, things occurring in, in this area. So obviously, um, one of the consequences of this warming trend, localized warming trend, especially in, in Jasper, is the expansion of Mount Pine Beetle in Jasper, which basically exploded since 2013. Uh, conditions have been made perfect for it to go, and it did. Um, expansion has been mostly from the west, expanding to the south, uh, the north, and the east, up to the uh, Alberta border. Uh, we have, um, Alberta actually did some um, green red uh, uh, tr green red attack uh, ratio surveys in the park last fall, and found in some areas, especially north and east of the Jas Jasper town site, populations are so high uh, we're seeing 100 green attacked trees for every one red attack tree. And for those that aren't familiar with that uh, survey, um, a red attack tree is a tree that's been killed the previous year. And a green attack tree is a recently attacked tree, so attacked in the current year. And it's a good indication of population growth. So population seems to be doing fairly well in these areas. Uh, this was also evidenced by uh, 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 reports of spruce trees being attacked. So you know when non-host trees are being attacked, populations are high. So we did have some cold weather before Christmas, but uh, we're not sure yet how that's going to affect the population in the new year. Uh, another issue we observed within the national parks, and in fact, it's occurring in Western Canada, is uh, the, su the suspected effect of the warming trend ha that's having it's having on uh, on first both subalpine fir and balsam fir in Western Canada. Uh, they haven't been doing very well over the last couple of decades. Uh, Western balsam bark beetle has been really affected. Subalpine fir stands uh, throughout its range. However, um, it's been noted that that some of the damage, especially occurring in the south and like the Waterton Lakes National Park area, is not entirely caused by the beetles. So there's other things affecting these trees. Uh, some of the things I've, I've observed are like cytospora canker, armillary root rot, or just basically a branch flagging uh, caused by white spotted soy or beetle feeding. Um, and these can all be just secondary agents. In some of the uh, northern states, I know they've termed much of this general subalpine fir mortality, uh, they class it as just SAF, uh, and they relate it to climate and drought damage. The balsam fir mortality, which became pretty apparent back in the early 90s, again, really has no definitive causal agent. Um, the stuff that I've looked at, researchers, uh, northern researchers, basically Ken Mallet, pathologist, and, and Dave Langer, uh, entomologist out of Northern Forestry Center. They looked at this stuff early on in the 90s, uh, and all they came up with was basically uh, drought-induced mortality with our malaria. Um, so we've seen this balsam fir mortality as far north as the southeast corner of Wood Buffalo National Park, and the subalpine fir, fir mortality I've seen it as far as uh, up into the territories just north of Fort Liard on, on the Mount Cody Range. So these on the map, you see these red outlined areas. These don't mean a heck of a lot. All I mean is that these are areas that I've looked at. Uh, uh, I've looked at these uh, conditions on the ground. I've looked at these fir trees. So moving on, uh, again, lots of different drought conditions uh, throughout uh, the Rockies. I'm going to focus on some of them, and I might skip through some of them because we are running late. Um, the pine, uh, basically, this is just south of Jasper uh, town site. Don't worry about the area. It's actually a bigger area. This was mapped on the ground at the time. Uh, what is interesting here is that these are similar soil conditions as we see up in the territories in the jack pine. This is lodge full pine. Again, very porous, gravelly soils cannot hold the moisture anymore, and these trees are suffering. Uh, a little further to the south in Jasper and Banff is um, this is basically an area of spruce and aspen along the Icefields Parkway. Uh, this is interesting because this is relatively high elevation areas. 
and uh, this is basically south of the uh, Columbia ice field, so pretty high elevation area. And we're seeing uh, uh, branch mortality and some and some uh, mortality in the aspen and firs. Again, miscellaneous uh, drought uh, or climate-related uh, damage occurring in various areas here. We have Doug Fir region uh, being stressed out in uh, Jasper National Park. Discoloration of foliage, red tips on the needles, and uh, premature needle drop at the base are standard symptoms of growth. Uh, I threw in the Cooley Ice Free Skull Adelgid uh, picture here because uh, it tends to be a good indicator of uh, drought conditions. It tends to explode when, uh, when uh, during drought conditions. And uh, we've seen a good outbreak in uh, throat. Much of the Rocky Park uh, in basically 2013, 2014, 2015. Not so much in 2016. Uh, another in, uh, evidence of drought conditions are the uh, drought induced heavy spruce cone crops. The physiological uh, needle droop uh, we saw in Glacier, Mount or sorry, Mount Revelstoke National Park. Um, this was pretty interesting because I, I hadn't seen this before. I'd seen it on uh, red pine. It's very similar to what you see on red pine uh, out east, red pine region during drought years. Get this. Uh, basically, what happens is uh, you get this. Um, uh, vas you get the vascular tissues around the branch tips. They desiccate, shut down, causing the needle to turn red. Through. And uh, this was noted uh, meadow in the sky uh, park in, in uh, Mount Revelstoke National Park. Uh, so basically, uh, more um, more evidence of drought conditions. Uh, some more important ones to point out here are the drought scalding symptoms that we see on south facing slope, subalpine, alpine fir, and glacier Mount Revelstoke. Uh, as well, we are also noted some uh, frost damage occurring in some of these areas. Uh, the western red cedar sun scalding on the far right here. This was really interesting. This was in Glacier uh, National Park. This picture in particular is on the valley floor, but you could see this damage up uh, on higher elevations on the, the slope, uh, mostly occurring on the south facing or southwest facing uh, slopes. And um, as you can see in these pictures, uh, the, the majority of the damage is on the sun facing side of the tree and gradually uh, uh, turns back to green on the, the protected side of the tree. Uh, the other interesting thing was this, what I'm terming micro red belt. Uh, some of these patches were seen in damp at high elevation. And typically, red belt will cause a long red band along uh, an entire slope. These were kind of like microburst areas that were just kind of uh, fried. And uh, uh, they were elongated, but they weren't your typical long red band. So, pretty interesting. Uh, okay, last slide of observation because we're we're getting long. But this is uh, right down in the south. This is Waterton Lake National Park. We're seeing drought symptoms on subalpine fir, or suspected drought symptoms on subalpine fir, uh, pretty substantial. Uh, this is in the Red Rock Canyon area, and we're seeing, uh, of course, down in that area, tons of aspen dieback and willow dieback throughout throughout the uh, the whole area. So that's pretty much it for the pictures. Um, we're not in Kansas anymore. And when I say this, uh, first I'll, I'll describe the uh, the image here. I don't know if you can make it out. It's Dorothy holding Toto. She says, I miss Kansas. Toto says, I miss the rains down in Africa. So people over, I don't know, 35 will probably get that. But um, anyway, when I say we're not in Kansas anymore, I just mean times have changed. Um, forest health monitoring, it's just not about pests anymore. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, it's not so simple. We can't just run out to the forest, map spruce budworm, and, and, and call it good. Um, there's so many widespread intermingling issues out there. Uh, it's becoming difficult uh, to assess and quantify these things um, with standard pest survey methods. We need more integrated approaches. Uh, uh, to, to better understand these, these changes that are occurring, um, and especially if we want to start uh, achieving better forecasting of, of what's to come. Uh, so we need to start paying more attention to climate, fire, fire history, you know, insect and disease history, uh, you know, 
forest productivity data just to, to get a better understanding of what's going on. Um, I'm not going to go through all this, but um, when I say monitoring intensity varies across the country, uh, this was pretty evident when I went to the pest forum. Um, and this is, this is especially pertinent in the north where resources and staffing are relatively small compared to uh, the other problems. I mean, so again, if you look at this Environment Canada map, when it comes to monitoring, uh, and it's pretty limited where it's needed more. In my mind, that's my opinion. Um, yeah, so we need we need to pay attention to more. We need more monitoring, more research. Uh, we need to start doing vulnerability assessments and adaptation strategies in these areas. And yeah, more thoughts. That's just about it. Um, I'd like to wrap it up here and say thanks very much to uh, the external partners. So uh, all the government Northwest, Ter Northwest Territories folks and Parks Canada folks. Uh, this work's not possible without them. As well, uh, many internal CFS collaborators. Special thanks to Jacob Olusinski uh, up in the territories, the ecosystem forester out of uh, Hay River, and uh, he manages the government or Northwest Territories Forest Health Program. As well, Ted Hogg and Tricia Hook, climate tree ring experts out of Northern, and uh, Jim Weber, who's been a uh, forest health secretary uh, and has been pretty invaluable in contributing to both uh, monitoring programs over the years. <clears throat> as well, Todd Bramsfield, Colin Mirholm, uh, they're, they're with the pathology and mycology group here in Northern, and Greg Cole, insect taxonomist uh, here at Northern, uh, for the uh, dozens of annual identifications they provide every year to these programs. Uh, so yeah, that's about it. I'll turn it back over to Annette. Uh, I'm sorry for going too long, and uh, if anybody has any questions. Great. Thanks, Roger. You're actually right on time, so this is perfect. Um, so we have about 15 minutes left for questions. Um, again, if you'd like to use the uh, chat box on the left-hand side of the screen, please go ahead and type out your question there. Um, if you're on the conference call line with us and would prefer to ask a question over the telephone, uh, just a reminder to hit star six and that will unmute your line. So I don't see anybody typing out questions just yet. Um, so I'll go to the conference call line. Is there anybody that has a question for Rod? Okay, I see some people typing now. Um, so Roger, I have a question for you in the meantime. Um, so going back to the jasper tree species being affected by drought, did you sample any other species? Um, and if so, what did they look like? Yeah. Yeah, we sampled uh, we sampled four species in total. So we did uh, uh, aspen, uh, spruce, and the spruce is comprised of Engelman and, and white spruce. Uh, we did pine and uh, dug fir. What was interesting with uh, the pine is that it seems to be holding steady. There's there's no real decrease, no real increase. Uh, of course, pine's more drought tolerant, but uh, in the areas that we sampled, we did notice um, uh, there was a lot of self thinning going on because of, of uh, these trees weren't doing the best. However, the growth in the trees that were left standing uh, seemed to be normal. It just seemed to be just holding steady, so not decreasing and increasing. Uh, the other species was pretty in interesting as well. It was uh, dug for the areas that we sampled. Uh, all three stands that we did sample showed, two of them showed a slight increase. The third stand showed a real dramatic increase. It was pretty substantial. Um, and this increase, though, that stand that we sampled was actually a, uh, a mechanically thinned stand uh, right outside the Jasper Park Lodge. So uh, they were thinning for fire guards. So that was interesting in itself because that, that you know, that might tell us something about uh, uh, adaptation strategy in some of these areas for certain that might not work for all. That was that was interesting. Great. Hope that answers your question. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so we have a question here from Greg Cole in the chat box. So great summary of info. Um, do you feel like this information is getting the uptake it deserves with decision makers? <laughs> um, well, hard to say at my level. Uh, 
I, I get the information out there as much as I can. Um, I've given this presentation a few times to different people. We've had some, um, you know, some discussions with the above folks that were doing research uh, up in the north there. Um, I, I think the message is getting out there that things are happening. I, I hear a lot about, you know, the potential of what can come, the potential of what could happen. Um, and, you know, I, I, we're, we're seeing it now, you know, uh, Jacob and I in the north and, and some of the parks folks, we're seeing things uh, happening now. It's not devastating. It's not, it's not all doom and gloom. Uh, there's still tons of healthy, beautiful forests out here in Western Canada. It's just things are changing. We're seeing some some differences. So, um, yeah, you know, it's, it's a tough question to answer. The message I'm hoping will eventually get out there the more we, we talk about it and uh, discuss it. Okay. Well, we'll have to see. It, it certainly hasn't turned into dollars yet. I'm going to say that much. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Andre. Uh, just some kudos there from Anna Meyer. I saw some other people typing, so we'll give everyone a few more minutes. I'll go back to the conference call line. Is there anybody that has a question for Roger? If so, please go right ahead. Okay. I'll give everybody just a few more seconds here. I believe I saw some people. Oh. Okay, so Dave Peterson in the chat box here. Um, so, many of the insect and pathogen problems appear to be in dense stands that are experiencing stress, even in the absence of drought and heat. Is this an accurate perception? Do you think that some species have sufficient diversity to adapt to the warmer climate over time? Uh, yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, many, many of these um, any of these things occurring that we've seen, in, especially in the north or in the Rockies, uh, when it comes to the, the, the insects and disease uh, responding to a warming trend, I mean these are these are normal responses. It's it's the warming trend that that isn't isn't normal. So um, will they adapt? I mean I think I think we're seeing them adapt by by their their migrants. The way they move. Uh, as far as uh, diversity, I don't know. It's it's interesting about the change in diversity. When you when you look at the you know the consequences of the wildfire, uh, uh, the, the high severity wildfires that we see, if they do in fact change uh, alternate forests uh, or change into alternate forests, so you have a jack pine stand that's severely uh, burnt or reburnt. And uh, may not come back as jack. I mean, that's that's going to have a significant uh, effect on biodiversity in some areas, as we saw. You know, as we, uh, as I said, occurred in the ponderosa pine stand down in uh, California, where they've just uh, turned into grassland. So, I mean, it's it's really it's really a tough question to answer because it's, we have so many questions. We don't know exactly what's going to what's going to occur. And um, I mean, maybe that question is, is better left to one of the uh, climate researchers. All right, thanks, Roger. Or hopefully that, that helps a little bit. Absolutely. OK, so we have a few more questions coming in here. So Vanessa Ford has a question. So have you thought about the role of declining snowpack in snow seasons leading to drier soils and Rocky Mountain Park, not just drought? Yeah, I I uh, I haven't, but I mean, I have and I haven't. When I say drought, I'm just talking about moisture deficit. So whether that that moisture deficit comes from uh, the rivers and creeks drying up, or it being so hot that uh, you know the soil's drying out, or we're just not getting enough precipitation on an annual basis. So yeah, it could come from any any one of these things, and that's that's a definite. Uh, definite factor, and especially uh, it's not just in the Rocky Mountain Park. We, we see it up in the uh, in the Mackenzie Mountains as well, or or even into the Yukon, shrinking glaciers. It's all going to have a factor for sure. Okay. 
Okay, so a question here from Anna Meyer. So, other than the big picture efforts to reduce climate change, is there anything else that can be done? Um, anything um, climate change that contributes to the forest stress? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, there's there's not a lot that can be done about what we're seeing, right? If this warming trend's gonna, this is these are just my opinions. Uh, I'm not a, a climate change spokesman or expert. Um, but from what I see happening, if, if this, these warming trends are going to continue, these kind of things uh, are going to get worse and worse. Uh, we're going to see them come down into uh, lower elevation. Really, I mean, the high latitude and high elevation stuff, I think, you know, these things we can learn a lot from what's happening now. And they, they might be the canary in the coal mine kind of thing of what we can expect throughout uh, the boreal forest down the road, you never know. I mean, obviously the boreal forest, the, the southern latitudes won't be dealing with uh, melting permafrost issues, but they're certainly going to be dealing with uh, the pest, the changes in pest behavior and uh, wildfires and drought. Um, these are going to go back to your question. Um, is there anything that can be done? Yeah, I mean we can we can just start learning from what is occurring in these areas. Um, uh, in my mind, uh, you know, uh, governments and industry can start uh, thinking more about um, how they do business adaptation, uh, develop some good adaptation strategy, and uh, to just be prepared in case things do continue the way they continue. That's that's what I would say. Look at the vulnerability of our forest and uh, start thinking about adaptation strategies. Perfect, Roger. Um, so, one last question here from Anil. Um, so, great information. Just wondering if there's a plan to integrate valuable, uh, valuable information with remote sensing to scale up what's going on. Yeah, definitely. I mean, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, locally here, we, we've, we've created a, a a band of merry researchers uh, to do exactly that. It's, it's to build upon these observations and and uh, and basically um, expand upon this this level of monitoring and research in these areas. Um, so yeah, and also you know we've had some discussions on collaboration uh, efforts with the above uh, study that's occurring up in the territory. To be honest, I'm not in the loop in uh, in exactly what or if we are continuing with any of those collaborations. But I know the feeling out of our office for sure is that uh, that's why we formed Healthy Group is to really start uh, getting some science behind looking at this stuff and and to to scale up exactly what we see occurring. Perfect. Okay, we're just about out of time here, so I'm going to go to one last try at the conference call line to see if anybody has a question over the phone. If so, please go ahead. Okay, so if not, um, Roger, can people email you if they have any further questions? Is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. And I'm also going to start a discussion forum on the FA COP for those wanting to continue the discussion. So I welcome everybody to sign up. Um, if you haven't done so already. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today for the webinar. We hope you enjoyed it. A very big thank you to you, Roger, for your time and effort and for a great and informative presentation. Um, any last comments from you before we sign off here? No, nope, that's it. Uh, thanks for listening. Perfect. All right. Well, thanks, everybody.